Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2. If this is your first time with us, uh, you're smack dab. Actually, we, you're, we're getting near the end of our, our, our sermon series on Sundays and our Bible study on Wednesday nights on spiritual warfare. And we spent a lot of time trying to help you to see the world through the lens of Scripture. Uh, you do realize that 80% of life you can't see, you can't hear, you can't feel, or can't touch. Again, can I touch Naomi's love for me? No, but are you going to try to tell me that's not real? I can't touch my wife's love for me. Are you going to try to tell me? So I, I hope you're beginning to realize an adult thinking person, a mature thinking person, begins to realize that there's so much of life that we can't see, hear, feel, or touch. I would like to suggest that the real world is in that, where, that place where we can't see, heal, or touch. I want to spend my life in love. I want to spend my life in joy. I want to spend my life in peace. I don't want to spend my life in Netflix. I don't want to spend my life on Facebook. Lord, if I did that, <laughs> why? It's just a miserable place to live. And so we, we spent the first couple of weeks just trying to open your eyes to the fact that we are living in a world at war, that it's, we're, it, we're in the midst of an angelic battle. Uh, but then lately we started talking about just practical ways that we can fight back, practical ways that we can stand firm, practical ways that we could stop giving ground over to the evil one and his forces, because you do realize he wants to just wipe you out. He wants to destroy everything that's precious for you. Some of you right now are sitting in here by yourself. Why? Because you've lived in a world at war, and that war has taken your marriage. That war has taken your children. That war has taken your jobs. That war has you've lost everything, and yet some of you are still wondering if what Randy's talking about is true. Again, while we might not be able to see the effect, uh, see this war. We sure are living in the effects, and we sure can feel the effects. So many of us have generational curses on us right now that we're going to be struggling with, that we're going to be fighting for years to come. Why? Because we live in a world at war. And so we've been talking about that, and we've been trying to get more practical, because again, I'll make another promise to you. My promise has been for this church ever since we started it in December 2008, that everything I give you on Sunday morning, you're going to be able to use on Sunday afternoon. Everything I give you, on Sunday, we're not going to waste your time here. The time is the most precious thing you have. And so if we have a service, if we, whether it be study hall at 930, whether it be Wednesday nights or whatever, if we have a service, I promise you it will not be a waste of your time. And we're going to give you stuff that you can use, stuff that's in the nitty gritty. That's why I talk about all these uncomfortable examples. Why? Because if your Christianity is not making a difference in your bedroom, then it, what kind of Christianity is it? If your Christianity is not making a difference at your dinner table, what kind of Christianity is it? If your Christianity is not making a difference in your checkbook, in your finances, then what kind of Christianity is it? It's not much. And so that's why we get so kind of graphic. That's why we get very, uh, we talk about meddling. Well, we do that here. Why? Because we want, Jesus wants to be the Lord of everything in your life, not just Sunday mornings from 1030 to 12-ish, all right? And so why don't we start off with this simple fact, because this is, to me, the most practical message I've ever preached when it comes to dealing with things that affect us all. And so let's start off with this fact, and the fact is this. All of us, underline that word all, are prisoners of war, POWs, in this battle for the world. All of us are prisoners of war, POWs, in this battle for the world. Each of us, you know what a prisoner of war is, right? It's someone who's been held captive by the enemy and often tormented and tortured and defeated and destroyed. Okay, we've had presidential candidates who their left arm doesn't work and they walk with a limp, right? Because they were prisoners of war in a battle and that it, while they were prisoners of war, they were tormented and tortured and, and it caused physical harm to them. Well, each of us is what I'm saying here, is all of us are prisoners of war in this battle for the war. We're all prisoners of war in this spiritual warfare that we're in. You're saying, Randy, how do you know that? Well, I believe, and I believe the scripture talks about, that each of us are held hostage by what 2 Corinthians 10, 4 says, the strongholds of the mind. The stronghold of of the mind. What's he talking about? That mindset, that thought process, right? That holds us captive to sin. You're saying stronghold? What are you talking about? What does it mean stronghold? If you know anything about the Bible, you know it's talked about in scripture, but let me give you a practical definition of a stronghold. The definition of a stronghold is this, an area of defeat in our life based on biblical sin. 
an area of defeat in our life based upon biblical sin. Now, if you're not a Christian, then every area of your life is a stronghold. Okay? It's all under the authority. It's all under uh, the control of the evil one and his forces. But e- even Christians can, and that's why I say all of us, even Christians have strongholds in their life, that area of defeat based upon biblical sin. They're designed, what the strongholds are designed to do is accomplish John 10.10, 10, where it says the devil and his demon's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. And so what the devil and his forces do, the, mainly demons for us, is they create a stronghold. They work hard to help us, to get us to create the stronghold in our mind. What is that? It's an area of defeat in our lives based on biblical sin. And what the devil and his demons will do is he will partner with us to create this stronghold in our mind, this area of sin. Why? So that we are held captive, that we are held hostage. So this is how it works. You see, it's an evil force, because again, it's an area of defeat. It's one of those, play, those sins in your life that you, you try to overcome, you try to beat back, you try to defeat, but you can't. It's one of those areas in your life where you know what you're doing is wrong, you know what you're looking at is wrong, you know what you're saying is wrong, you know what you're feeling is wrong, you know, but you just can't stop. Well, that's a stronghold in your life. That's an area of defeat in our lives based upon biblical sin. So if the evil forces can deceive us into thinking, well, there's nothing I can do about blank, whatever your stronghold is. If the devil and his forces can convince us that there's nothing we can do about it, or, hey, this is just my cross to bear, even though the cross that you bear is never sin, according to Scripture, But if the devil can convince you that this is just your cross to bear, this is something that you can't overcome, this is something you just have to live with, then guess what? We are prisoners in our own mind. And we're the one holding the key. We've locked ourselves up as Christians. Now, some strongholds, you're saying, Rena, give me an example of something. Well, some strongholds are obvious, right? They could be uh, uh, addictions, right? It could be addictions to drug, alcohol, sex, right? Some strongholds are obvious. It could be a a sinful relationship that you're in. You're in a sexual relationship with somebody, and you know you should stop. You know you shouldn't be doing this. You know you shouldn't be there, and yet you keep it up. You can't stop, won't stop, right? Uh, It it could be something obvious. It could be a codependent relationship. Some of you walked in here, and it's obvious to everybody in your life that you have sinful, evil, wicked, codependent relationships. It could be with a parent. It could be with an ex. It could be with a friend. That person in your life that you think that you can't uh, live without, that's obvious to everyone around you. They're sitting there going, man, that is just sad that they are enslaved to this person like that. But I've also found that most uh, strongholds are not so obvious. It could be pornography or sexual addiction. It could be fear or worry. It could be pride or entitlement. It could be gluttony or laziness. For example, some of you right now, you have a stronghold over your finances. What's that mean? You know what God's Word says about your finances. Listen, you don't have to be in church more than 10 minutes. You don't even have to be in church all of your life to understand that, 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 that God expects you to give a portion of your money to Him and to His church. He expects you to spend the rest of your money wisely and smartly. And yet you've got this, this spending addiction you, where you can't stop, won't stop. You make good money, but you've got thousands of dollars of credit card debt. You know, Josh and I talk about it all the time because, you know, he's in the financial industry. We talk about it. We don't have a money-making problem in America. We have a spending problem in America. And this is a stronghold in your life. This is a, 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 this is a problem area in your life. Well, guess what? Any area of sin that Christians say, I can't stop, any area of sin where Christian says, uh, I'm trapped, any area of sin that you can get so bad where you can even say, I don't have to stop, even though it's sin, that is a stronghold. Why? Because Romans 6, 14 says, sin is no longer a Christian's master. Now, here's the thing. We want to blame people. We want to say, well, if it wasn't for my mom and my daddy, if it wasn't for my neighbor, if it wasn't for my president, if it wasn't for this political party, if it wasn't for my mayor, if it, if it wasn't for my boss, if it wasn't for my wife, if it wasn't for my children, if it wasn't, then, then it wouldn't be this way. Can I share something with you real quick? If you're taking notes, write this down. Your stronghold is yours. Your stronghold is yours. I promise. I get it. People can tempt you. 
They can encourage you. They cannot make you have a stronghold in your life. It may be a stronghold of anger, hateful, bitter, unforgiving anger. Now, people can tempt you, obviously. They can encourage you. Here's how I know, by the way, because you know what? My, my ex-wife had convinced me, around her fourth affair, my ex-wife convinced me that it was my fault that she was cheating on me so much. I mean, that, that, that psychological warfare was crazy. But then one day, God intervened. And this is what he showed me. There was a lot of men in my life that treated their wives a lot worse than I did her. And yet, they, those wives didn't cheat on their husbands. I knew a couple where the man was abusive, and I was counseling and doing everything in my power to get her out of this abusive situation, and yet this woman refused to cheat on her husband even though he beat her mercilessly. And it finally reminded me, God set me free with the truth, that guess what? My ex-wife's stronghold, that was her. That was, she owned it. I, I, maybe I could tempt it, maybe I can encourage it, but it's mine. Well, don't be my ex-wife. The first step for many of you is to stop trying to blame other people for your stronghold. If you want victory today, because that's why we're here. If you want to overcome today, that's why we're here. Stop blaming your daddy. Once you get past eight years old, you need to stop blaming your parents for the stupidity in your life. Right? We want to blame other people, but you know what? They can encourage us, they can tempt us, they can set us up. But it's still on us. You're saying, okay, Randy, you're right. You're right. I've got this area of defeat in my life. I'm so sick and tired. I'm tired, I'm tired of hiding it from those that I care about. I'm tired of hiding it from you. I'm tired of hiding it from others. Randy, I've got this area of defeat in my life, this gluttony, this, this laziness, this pride, this whatever. Randy, I've got this area of my defeat in my life. And Randy, I've gone to the doctor about it. I've gone to therapy about it. I've done this. I've done that. I've, got, I've, done, I've done all I know to do. Randy, I want freedom. I want victory. How do I overcome the problem in my life? It's found in this truth. The answer is found in this truth, and that is this. We cannot deal with a spiritual problem with physical solutions. We cannot deal with a spiritual problem with physical solutions. 2 Corinthians 10.4 continues. It says, the weapons we use in our fight are not the world's weapons, but God's powerful weapons, which we use to destroy strongholds. We use to destroy that area of defeat in our lives based upon biblical sin. We use it to destroy God's weapons. We use God's powerful weapons to destroy that habit, that addiction, that thought, that whatever. We use God's powerful weapons to destroy them. You're saying, Randy, why? Because Ephesians 6, 12 says it. I know I've read it to you. I'm going to keep reading it to you. So some of you start quoting it back to me, and that is this. We are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. You want to know why your therapist has not worked? You want to know why your, all those self-help books have not worked? You want to know why all the friends that have counseled you have not worked? Why? You cannot do, use physical pro, uh, solutions to solve spiritual problems. You cannot get humans to fix humans. Why? Because we are not wrestling with humans. And our solution, our salvation will not be found in humans. So guess what? You can take all the drugs you want. You can go to all the counseling that you want. You can think happy thoughts all you want, but a spiritual problem must be solved with spiritual solutions. You're saying, Randy, should I not be taking my antidepressant medicine? Randy, should I not be taking my anti-anxiety medicine? I'm not saying that, but I am saying this. That anti-depression medicine, that anti-anxiety medicine, all they're dealing with is the effects of your stronghold. They're not dealing with the source. And you cannot fix a spiritual problem with a physical drug. I don't care if it's sex, I don't care if it's alcohol, I don't care if it's anything else, if it's money, you cannot fix a spiritual problem with physical solutions. And so you're saying, Randy, how do I come? How do I overcome? How do I over, if I can't use therapy, if I can't use drugs, if I can't use money, if I can't use people to fix my spiritual problem, how do I overcome my personal strongholds? Well, read with me if you would. In Ephesians chapter 2, beginning with verse 4, and we're going to see the first thing that we need to do if we're going to overcome our personal strongholds. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning with verse 4, says this. But God is so rich in mercy. 
And he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by grace that you have been saved. Verse 6 says this, For Father God raised us up from the dead along with Jesus Christ and seated us with Jesus in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us as shown in all that he has done for us who are united you might want to notice that word united united with christ jesus he's saying you know what the first thing we're going to do if we're going to beat our a personal stronger if you're going to walk out of here free from your addictions if you're going to walk out of here free from your generational curses the first thing you got to remember is that you got to remember our position in christ you've got to remember every christian every believer every god fear and bible believe in jesus love and christians position in christ you say, Randy, well, how do you know that? Well, go back to verse 6. It says, Father God raised us, talking about Christians. He raised Christians up with Jesus Christ and seated us with him. Now, what in the world does it mean to be seated with Jesus? It means that we have been given his position and his power to handle that position. Let me say that again because you might want to write it down. To be seated with Christ means that we have been given his position and the power to handle that position. You're saying, what do you mean by that? Well, think about the president. What is the pre- How do you become president? You are selected and chosen to fulfill the position of president in, of these United States. But then immediately, you've seen it on TV, you've seen it on shows, you, you've heard about it. That president is given the nuclear uh, briefcase, right? The, the, the briefcase that where at a moment's notice, he can unleash the nuclear arsenal of the United States of America. Now, why in the world would one of the first things they give the president of the United States is that nuclear briefcase? Why? Because you can't have the position of something without having the power to do it. There's nothing more miserable in life than having a position like president, a position like father, like a position as a Christian, a position as a wife without the power to put it into place. I know, for example, in my senior year in high school was one of the most miserable years of my life. I was, ele- I was selected, I was chosen as the battalion commander of the ROTC program at my high school. But here's the problem. You wanna, you're saying, Randy, that's an honor. Yeah, there was 450 cadets that every time I walked by I had to put up their arm and salute me, especially on Wednesdays when we wore the uniform. You're saying, Randy, that's an honor. That's, yes, that's great. No, it wasn't. It was miserable. You want to know Why? Because while I was given the position of battalion commander, I was not given the power of battalion commander. I was given no ability to do my job by the people in charge. And there's nothing more miserable than somebody who's been given a position with no power. And when, it, when the Bible says that you and I have been seated with Christ, right? As children of God, we become like Jesus because Jesus is the Son of God. When we are seated with Christ... We share his position as a child of God and his power to handle that position. That's what Colossians 3.12 is saying. He says, Father God chose you to be the holy people he loves. Think about that. He's saying he chose Christians to live without sin. Now, how in the world can he do that? Why? He chose us to be children of God. He chose us to be uh, children, uh, brothers and sisters of Jesus. But then he gives us the power to live without sin. He gives them both. That's what it means to be seated with Christ. You're saying, Randy, why is that important? Because of this fact, and the fact is this. Our position in Christ gives us victory over our stronghold. Our position in Christ gives us victory over our strongholds. That's what Ephesians 1.21 is saying. He says, Jesus is far above any ruler or authority or power. He's talking about devil and demons right there. Or leader or anything else. And so what the Bible is saying when he says that we are seated with Christ, that we are positioned with Christ, that we have the power of Christ, that that means what? That means that we, too, are far above the devil and the demons that are attacking us. That means we, too, have the authority over the devil and the demons in our lives. He's saying, Randy, what, what's that got to do with my stronghold? What's that got to do with my problem? Follow this logic. Maybe this will help. Is it going to be up there? Yes. Here's the logic. Maybe this will make sense to you. Jesus, the Bible teaches, has defeated and is over the devil and his demons. Right? Can we agree on that? Say amen if you agree with that. Well, guess what? 
The devil and his demons are the source of our problem, according to Ephesians 6.12. Can I get an amen? Amen. Well, if Jesus has defeated is over the devil and his demons, and we are seated in Christ, we are united with Christ, we are positioned with Christ, that in Christ we have the power over the devil and demons. Can I get an amen? amen? Do you see it? This is key. Do you understand now why the devil wants to deceive you? He wants to distract you. He wants to convince you that you're just old, so old, some old sinner saved by grace. You ain't got no power. You ain't got no strength. You ain't got no, you ain't got no ability to live the Christian life. The devil spends all this time trying to get you to forget who you are in Christ, that you are seated with Christ, that you are united with Christ, that you are one with Christ. Why? So he can defeat you and keep you in bondage. And so stop dealing with your problems naturally. Stop trying to fix your your issues on your own or with other people. Start connecting to the power source to have authority, to have a victory. You're saying, Randy, will it work? Let me give you the truth. The truth is this. Our position as God's children gives us authority over evil forces. Our position as God's children gives us authority over evil forces. Colossians 2.10 says this, You Christians also are complete through your union. There's that word again, union with Christ. Who is the head? By the way, he said, okay, we're, we're united with Christ. And then it says what? Who is the head over every ruler and authority? Remember, every time you see that phrase, every ruler and authority, he's talking about the devil and his demons, right? And so what's happening there is that Jesus, if you don't mind, write this down. Jesus gives us his authority over the devil and the demons attacking your your preschool class. Jesus gives us his authority over the devil and demons that's attacking your your marriage relationship. That Jesus gives us his authority over the demons that are destroying your children, destroying your grandchildren, destroying your life. We've been given authority over them. You're saying, Randy, how do you know? Well, we see the authority expressed in Acts 16, 18. You see, says Paul got so exasperated that he turned and said to the demon within her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And instantly that lily, that cowardly demon left her. That's our model. Jesus gives us his authority to say to the evil forces behind our stronghold, our worry, our lust, our fear, our selfishness, our pride, our ego. Jesus gives us the authority to say, you know what? Demon of lust, you know what? Demon of fear, you know what? Demon of pride, you know what? Demon of entitlement, you know what? You have no authority in my life. Get out. Think about this for a second. Maybe this analogy will help. Because I know right now the devil and his demons are fighting you trying to keep you from understanding what's going on here have you ever watched how about this we'll start easy how many of you have ever been in the house where a football game is on raise your hand because i know some of you pride yourself on never seeing a football game okay how many of you have actually watched a football game raise your hand okay one of the funniest things to me if you ever think about it is have you ever seen a football game by the way a a a a slow Bad football player in the NFL is like 280, nothing but muscle, can run 40 yards in under five seconds. All right, these are bad son of a guns. Have you ever noticed, though, what happens when one of those football players gets mad at a call from the ref and he accidentally bumps the ref? Just, just touches, not, not hurts him, but just graves him. Have you ever seen it? You see this scrawny 150-pound ref going, He pulls out his flag, and he throws the flag at the guy, and he goes, you're out of here. Have you ever thought about that for a second? You got this 300, 350-pound man who can bench press that ref with one arm. You got this 350-pound man who could snap that ref like a twig. But what happens when he makes the mistake of bumping the ref, ref pulls the flag, throws it at him, and says, get out. What happens to that big football player? He gets out. Why? Because that ref's been given authority by the NFL. That ref's been given authority by college football. That ref's been even been given authority by high school football. And when that ref says, you got to go, what happens? You got to go. Can I share something with you? That's us. Because we've been seated with Christ, we're united with Christ, we're one with Christ. 
when the devil makes the mistake of bumping one of us or committing some infraction in our life, doing something that he shouldn't, all we have to do is throw our spiritual flag out and hit him in the face with it and say, get out. You have no authority here. Why don't you, dad, start putting your authority to use? Why don't you, husbands, start putting your authority to use? Why don't you, children, start putting your... You see, this is not true just for the spiritual men like me. This is true for my fifth graders on up. If they have Christ in their heart, that little bitty fifth grader's got authority over that big demon. And all they need to do to have victory is to remember their position in Christ. But there's a second thing we've got to do. We've got to remember our position in Christ, but the second thing we've got to do is we've got to rely on God's provision. We've got to rely on God's provision. He's given us stuff. He's offered us. If there's some things that Jesus has given us that we've got to rely on, we've got to put our faith in. Notice what James 4, 6 says. This is the brother of Jesus talking. He says, Father God gives greater grace. As the scriptures say, God opposes the proud, but, there's that word again, gives grace to the humble. Notice the word gives. You want to know why some of you, and you're, you're the most miserable people I know. You want to know why some of you Christians, you've been Christians for so long, but you live in defeat, you live in de- despair, you live in depression. Why? Because God wants to give you His solution to your problem, but you're so prideful, or maybe you've been taught wrong, or whatever, you're still trying to earn God's solution. You're trying to earn God's problem solver. You're trying to make yourself good enough, make yourself, do it yourself. And can I share something with you? I call that, write this down if you're taking notes, I call that your natural man, Christian. It's not going to probably be on the screen, I don't know. She may have put it there, I don't know. But you you can listen and write, right? That's your natural man. Your natural man is when you try to do God things in your own power. Your natural man is when a Christian, right, who has Jesus living in him, who is united with Christ, he realizes there's a problem in his life, she realizes there's a problem in her life, she has something going on in her marriage, he has something going on at work, but rather than going to his source, rather than going to God's provision, they're like, well, I'm just going to handle it myself happens all the time in my house I'll, I'll i'll share something with one of my loved ones i'll say hey this is happening you got this sin in your life can you deal with it and most often their response is to say okay i'm just going to try harder i'm going to do gooder not only is that bad english that's really bad bible and so one of the reasons you're living in defeat is because god's trying to give you his provision and you're trying to earn it and you're saying randy why is that important well notice this fact God's solution to our problem is to offer greater grace. God's solution to our problem is to offer greater grace. Now remember what grace is. Grace is God giving you something that you don't deserve. Grace is God doing for you something you can't do for yourself. Grace, there's a reason why we call it amazing, is because grace is God doing for us something that is impossible supernatural miraculous that's why it's grace and god's solution to our problems god's solution to our stronghold is to offer greater grace go back to verse six it says father god gives greater grace you see we want god to remove our problem we want god we want to escape our problem and god's like "Uh uh-uh I'm just going to give you greater grace. I'm just going to overwhelm your problem. I'm going to overwhelm your addiction. I'm going to overwhelm your your, your situation with greater grace. You're saying you're greater than what? Greater than the mess that that you're in. Greater than what? Greater than your problem, your addiction, your stronghold. Greater than what? Greater than what's your past and your present and your future. Now hear me, God's not demeaning your problem. He's not saying that your anxiety is not real. He's not saying that your fear is not legitimate. He's just saying, you know what? My grace is greater than whatever it is you're going through. That's why 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says this. The man of God who wrote 13 books of the Bible says three times, God, remove this stronghold from my life. Remove this problem from my life. And God said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses, Paul said, so that the power of Christ can work 
through me. You're saying, but Randy, I've been abandoned. God's grace is better. But Randy, I've been abused. God's grace is better. Randy, I have, I'm facing addiction. God's grace is greater. You're saying, Randy, how do I get this grace? This is where I'm going to lose 70% of you. Some of you. 70% of you might as well just get up and leave. How do we get God's greater grace? It's found in this truth. And the truth is this. We must submit to God in order to receive greater grace. We've got to submit to God in order to receive greater grace. Grace. Some of you are saying, but Randy, I do submit to God. Really? Because not, mu- not too much earlier in James, he talks about those who live the unsubmissive life. Now, it's not going to be on the s- screen. He says if you're arguing and you're fighting and you're demanding, you're entitled, you're always trying to get what you want and get what you need and get what... You're not submitting to God. You're just submitting to your desires. You see, if we want greater grace... We've got to submit to God. Verse 7 of James 4 says, So submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. What does it mean to submit then? Because if this is the key to getting greater grace, and we need greater grace to overcome our addictions, we need greater grace to overcome our strongholds, if we need greater grace to overcome those things that defeat us, then we best figure out what it is. And here's the definition of submit. It means to surrender control to someone and do what they say. When it comes to submission, it is to surrender control to someone and do what they say. Our job is to submit to whoever it is, their will, their rule, their plan for our life, and refuse to rebel. We see in 1 Peter 5, 5, it says, you who are younger, submit yourself to your elders. What's he saying? He's saying, you who are younger, surrender control to your elders and do what they say. They say, you want greater grace, you want God's amazing grace, you want God's awesomeness in your life, then submit, young people, to your elders and do what they say. You want to know why some kids are more blessed than other kids? Because they submit to their elders and do what they say. It ain't complicated, it ain't hard, a retard could do it, but some of you, you're so prideful, you're so arrogant, you're so egotistical, you're so rebellious. Some of you are 60 years old and you still refuse to submit to the authority in your life you definitely don't submit to God and then you wonder why you're not receiving greater grace you say Randy what does it sound like when it comes to my problem what's it sound like when it comes to my stronghold what's it sound like when it comes to this area of defeat in my life it sounds like this Jesus I can't but you can when's the last time you said that I'll tell you the last time you surrendered. Jesus, I can't submit to my parents, but you can. Will you do it through me? Jesus, I can't submit to that boss. You know how lousy they are. I can't, but you can. Will you do it through me? Lord, I want to submit. And I submit to you first and foremost. All submission is unto the Lord. God, I submit to you. I surrender control of my life and I, to you, and I will do what you say now please remember something though because I, I get it i'm dealing with so many recovering baptist methodist episcopalians independents charismatics please remember submission is not commitment submission is not commitment commitment says to god i will Submit to says, submit, uh, commitment says to God, I'm going to try harder. I'm going to work harder. I'm going I'm to do better. But not only is commitment not submission, commitment keeps God from fixing our problems. Why? Because commitment is pride. What do you keep hearing? I, 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 I. I'm going to do better. I'm going to try harder. I'm going to fix it. I'm, God, I'm just going to work harder. I'm going to do better. I'm not going to be angry anymore. I'm not going to lose my temper anymore. I, 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 I. Guess what? God can't fix your problem because your pride is in the way. You see, submission is agreeing with 1 Corinthians 15, 27 that says, Father God has put all things under Jesus' authority. So again, submission says, God, I can't fix this mess, but you can. I surrender, submit myself to Jesus, and I will do what he says. 
I'm going to submit to the Bible as it is written. I'm going to submit to the Bible as it is preached. I'm going to submit to the Bible as you speak to my heart. I'm going to do what you say. And what's the result? James 4, 7 says, after we submit, we can resist the devil. And he will flee. You see, your problem is not the devil and his demons. Your problem is not your problem. Your problem is your pride that keeps you from submission. I've got people that have been in this church for 10 years and they still think submission is a bad word. It's the key to greater grace. How can that be bad? But you know what? Not only do we need to remember our position, not only do we need to rely upon his provision, one last thing, and this is, if I haven't lost 70% of you, I'm going to lose the rest of you right now, and that is we've got to repent of our sin. If we want to overcome our problem, if we want to defeat our addictions, if we want to defeat those things in our life that have held us hostage, we've got to repent of our sin. James 4, 8 and 10 continues, says, wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. Let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter, gloom instead of joy. Now, did you notice that? Notice all those words like tears and sorrow, deep grief, sadness and gloom. Right out beside that, by the way, that's where repentance begins. You want to know if you're starting to become repentant? And you do realize repentance is necessary for salvation. Some of you think you're Christians and you ain't never repented. How do I know? Because you ain't never been tearful, sorrowful, d- deeply grieved, sad, and gloomy over your sinfulness. And so you hadn't even got the introduction to repentance, and so therefore you ain't saved. You're saying, well, Randy, how do I get it? I've tried. Randy, you don't, you don't know. I've tried. I've, I've worked hard. I've tried to make myself cry over my sin. I've tried to be gloomy. You know, I've tried, I've tried, I've tried. No, notice the free, no, underline the phrase. It's there twice. Let there be, let there be. It's saying what? Let God give it to you. It means that, 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 that Joshua goes to God and says, Oh, God, here's my stronghold. Oh, God, please break my heart over what breaks yours. Oh, God, bring me tears and sorrow, deep grief, sadness and gloom over my sinfulness, over my stronghold, over my area of defeat. Oh, God, I can't, but you can. By the way, you don't think that the God that can knit you in your mother's womb can make you cry? Test him. You're saying, Randy, why is this so important? Why? Because of this fact. The fact is this. God can't help many of us because we don't sin. God can't help many of us because we don't sin. You see, most of us, especially lately, most of us don't sin. This is what we do. We make mistakes. Oh, I could have done better, but you know, I'm still a good person. By the way, if you start off with dealing with your sin by reminding me of of how good a person you are, you ain't repentant. Because number one, you ain't good. And number two, you wouldn't have sinned if you'd been good. But we don't sin in this culture anymore. We don't sin at Freedom Family Church. We just make mistakes. Well, here's the problem with that. Jesus didn't die for mistakes. He died for your sin. He died for that person that says, I know I'm supposed to give 10% to the church, but I ain't going to. That ain't a mistake. That's not a moral failing. That's sin. And the reason why God can't help you with it is why you don't admit that you're sinful. We're like the people in Malachi 3, 7. God says, ever since the days of your ancestors, you have scorned my rules and failed to obey them. God says, now return to me, says the Lord of heaven's army. But you ask, how can we return when we have never gone away? By the way, that happens every Sunday here. I call you to salvation. I make the case through the power of the Holy Spirit where you know that you know that you know that you are not right with God, that many of you are not saved. You know based upon the fruit of your life that you are not a Christian. And the Holy Spirit tugs at your hearts and says, come to me, come to me. Let me save you. Let me deliver you. Let me sanctify you. Let me free you from that sin. And you're like, God, how can I come to you? I've always been with you. You have not been with God all your life. 
But Randy, I've loved him since I was a kid. No, you didn't. And the reason why God can't help you, in fact, not only will he not help you, notice what James 4, 6 says. God opposes the proud. And so not only will God not help you with your mess, not only will God not fix your mess, no matter what God, no, 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 God won't heal your addiction because you are so prideful that he has to fight you and work against you. And so that very God that you think is winking at your sin, that very God that you think is, is okay with your failures and your mistakes, the very God, he is fighting you right now. Some of you are blaming the devil for things that God Almighty has brought on you. And so we've got to repent of our sin. You're saying, Randy, I want to repent. I don't know how. I want to. What do I do? Notice this truth. Repentance is a heart choice that results in physical change. Repentance is a heart choice that results in physical change. What do I mean by heart? He's talking about our thoughts, our choices, and our emotions. That's your heart. So when you see the word heart in the Bible, he's talking about the way you think, the way you choose, and the way you feel. And, and that's what he's talking about in James 4, 8. He says, wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. Now, he, James knows that repentance always results in a different way of acting, a different way of living. But he knows that, guess what? If you're ever going to change the way you act, then you've got to change your heart. He knew it. And so what do we do? The first thing, if we want repentance, we've got to let God change the way we think, the way we choose, and we feel about our sin. We have to ask God to change the way we think, the way we choose, and feel about our stronghold, our addictions, our problems, our defeat. We say, oh God, change the way I think, change the way I choose, change the way I feel about that sin. Then we're to do whatever it takes to remove it from our body and our actions. God gave me this example, and when he gave it to me, it was, first of all, uh, and then it was like, oh, yeah. Put up the picture for me. This is what your addiction is like. This is like what your stronghold is like. That big, lovely spider, <laughs> that's your addiction. That's your stronghold. That's your problem, right? Now, notice her back's turned. She don't even know it's there. Right? But say that woman walked in here today and she has been confronted with the fact that there's a spider on her back and it's that one. She's immediately going to watch. She walked in here today thinking that everything's copacetic. Everything's cool, right? We good. I'm, I'm wearing a blue shirt. My hair's looking pretty sweet. I'm great. Life's good. Let's go. But then the preacher reveals to her that there's a spider on her back. And so immediately she changes what? The way she thinks, the way she chooses, and the way she feels about her life. And then what happens? She does everything, yes, she does everything, if you're already doing it. She does everything she can to get that spider off her back. That's what it means to repent. You walk in here thinking everything's great, that that sin is just a way of life. It's just your curse cross to bear. It's just your generational curse. You walk in here thinking everything's okay, and then you realize that that sin, that's what that sin looks like to a holy God. And then you realize what is, that it's on you and that it's got you. You change the way you think. You change the way you choose. You change the way you feel. And then you slam your back against the wall as hard as you can to get rid of that spider. Get rid of the picture. It's hurt me. It's, it's, it, I, can't, I can't even look at people no more. All right, thank you. Okay. So do me a favor. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Let's talk to the Lord about this. Because some of you right now, you, you, you're getting all wiggly. You're ready to get that spider off of you. Every head bowed, every eye closed. You're saying, Randy, why are you bowing my heads and closing my eyes? Are you going to, I'm not going to untie your shoes. I'm not going to mess with you. I ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes. Why? There's lots of distractions around here. We've got a lot of people smelling good, looking good, feeling good, all that stuff. And right now, historically, Christians have known the best way to focus on God is to close your eyes and bow your heads. Remove the distractions. That's the only reason I ask you to do that. Now, are you beginning to realize why I say that half of everyone here is not going to heaven. After looking at what real repentance is, tears, sorrow, deep grief, 
brokenheartedness. Not just over a sin, but over our sin. All of it. This whole fullness. Have you ever had that? Have you ever experienced that? That brokenness. That tearfulness. That sorrow over your sin with a capital S. Because if you haven't, does that explain why you're not saved? Does that explain why the Holy Spirit is just yelling at me right now? Randy, they're lost. They're going to hell. And the worst part about it is they think they're saved. Could that be why you're not saved? Because you've never changed the way you think, you choose, and feel about your sin. Well, here's the thing. Right now, if you want, you can say, oh, God. Will you give me a heart of repentance? I know I'm a sinner. I know I don't just make mistakes. Lord, I sin. I'm not a mistake maker. I'm a sinner. But Lord, I need you. I can't make myself repent. Will you give me a heart of brokenness, a heart of hatred for that sin on, my, on me right now that's in me? Will you give me that? And then you can pray, oh God, just give me the faith to believe that Jesus can fix a wretch like me, that his grace is greater, his amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that can save a wretch like me. And if that's you, if that's happened to you today, if you've just been heartbroken over your sin, you know you're a sinner, you've been heartbroken over your sinfulness, and God, you believe and you know in your gut that Jesus can fix even you, now it's time for you to call. Now it's time for you to pray. Some of you have prayed all your life, but you've never prayed at the right time, at the right moment. Now's the time. Now's the moment. This is the chance for you to truly get saved. God has called you by giving you conviction over your sinfulness, by giving you repentance over your sinfulness, by giving you faith that He can fix you. He's calling you. This is your invitation. You don't get saved any old time you want to. You get saved now. Now is the time for salvation. You're saying, Randy, won't you give me some words? No. If you've got conviction, repentance, and faith, just talk to him. Call on him. Let him save you from that devil's hell. I don't care if you walk in here thinking that you are a saint, but now you realize you're a sinner that needs saving. Now's the time to do business with God. Oh, let me pray for you. you don't, if you're doing business with God, you don't have to listen to me pray. I'm just praying for you. You deal with God, but oh God, please be with us. Oh God, I still remember the tears you gave me as a five-year-old over my sinfulness. I remember the repentance you, you blessed me with as a five-year-old and the faith to believe that God could fix me. And I remember crying out to you on my grandmother's ugly indoor-outdoor carpet. Tears coming down my face, soaking the carpet, asking you to save me, and you did. Lord, if you could do that for five-year-old Randy, you could do that for anybody because he was wicked even in his mother's womb. Oh, Lord, save the lost. Save those who thought they were saved when they walked in here but realized that they aren't now. Save them, Lord God, as only you can. And we'll be very, very careful. To give you praise, because Randy can't save nobody. We'll honor you, because Freedom Family Church can't save nobody. And we'll give you all the glory. It's in Jesus' name I ask.